Hello, I'm Father Kurt Hine. I'm the rector of Light of Christ Anglican Church in Georgetown, Texas, and we are making our way through to be a Christian, an Anglican catechism. And the catechism teaches us the basics of the faith, faith in question and answer format. And we are now in Article 2 um, of the Apostles' Creed. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So uh, before we begin, let's take a moment and pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. All right. So let's begin here at um, question 53. What does it mean that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit? Jesus was conceived not through a human father, but by the Holy Spirit coming upon the Virgin Mary in power. So as Christians, um, we believe in God. So we're not materialists, we're not naturalists, meaning that we don't only believe that there is simply the material realm. We don't believe that there are only natural laws that are governing, governing everything. Um, however, this is largely the functional philosophy of our society. And so this idea that somehow Jesus would be conceived without sex, uh, without a biological father, is seen as completely ridiculous. Now it would be, except this is not what we believe. We don't believe that the material world is all there is or that natural laws are all that is. Uh, we believe that there is a God. That's the first thing. Um, in fact, we confessed and we talked about in the catechism. We believe that there is a God that both created the world and actively sustains it. And so given this presupposition that there is a God, this is quite possible. In fact, it makes sense that God could do something like this. In fact, it makes really good theological sense for God to do something like this because if we remember how brokenness and sin entered humanity, we remember that it started with Eve. It started with Eve, who did not believe God, but rather was deceived by the serpent. And so when God begins to undo the curse, he begins again. He, he, he undoes the curse through a woman, through Mary, who, unlike Eve, does not have this disposition of of doubt towards God or disbelief, but has a disposition of beautiful trust and faith. And so she says yes to God. And, and through that yes, Jesus is, is conceived within her and life, capital L life, is brought into the world. And so this is really, really beautiful. So to be really clear about this, Christians do not teach that God somehow had sex with Mary, okay? The true God is not like Zeus. There's all kinds of stories of Zeus going around raping women. It's, um, it's disgusting. The true God is spirit. So he's not constrained by space and time. So it's impossible, as well as blasphemous, this idea. Um, what happened was that the spirit's power was over Mary and causes her to conceive without intercourse upon Mary giving her consent to God through um, her yes to him. She becomes a holy vessel uh, of the very of, of, of God's presence, of the Lord's presence within her. Let's continue here with question 54. What happened at Jesus' conception in Mary's womb? The eternal son, whom God named Jesus, assumed a fully human nature from his mother, the Virgin Mary, at the moment of conception in her womb. Okay, this is why Christians historically have called Mary the mother of God or God-bearer, Theotokos in, in Greek. Um, it's really, it's misunderstood by many Protestants. Um, what we're saying is really not something about Mary as much as we're saying something about Christ. It's a Christological statement. When we call Mary the God-bearer or, or the mother of God, what we're saying is that there was never a time when Jesus was not God, that from the very moment of his conception, Jesus was fully God, that the Logos, that is God the Son, assumed a full human nature at the moment that he was conceived within the womb of the Virgin Mary. And so this actually makes Mary the very first Christian. Think about it. She was the very first to know God in the flesh, the very first to know Jesus. 
And so Mary is a, a marvelous example to every Christian as we open up our hearts to the Holy Spirit. Um, we actually, our bodies become a means whereby people experience the grace and love and life of God. And Mary, we see that in its, in its fullest form, don't we? Where she said yes to God. She trusted God. And, th and through her body, she literally brought capital L life, the resurrection life, into the world as a human. Let's continue here with uh, question 55. Why is it important to say that Jesus was born? It is important to affirm that he is one of us, truly human, born to a human mother, and raised in a human family. There, there's a lot of ancient heresies. Um, one of them is called Gnosticism. And what Gnosticism tends to do is it, uh, it creates a sharp, separation between the material and the spiritual world and the material world is bad and the spiritual world is good and one of the variants of this is called docetism and um, it's the belief that jesus was not actually um, did not actually have a body he only appeared to have a body and this is not really a heresy that makes sense to us today but it was very um, popular and very attractive to the culture uh, of that day of the early church and we see the, John the Apostle condemn this in his second epistle when he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So it's a really vital thing that we believe in the virgin birth, that we believe that God actually became a human and actually took on a human body. Because in doing so, He's, he's affirming the goodness of creation, especially the goodness of the human body. He shares um, all of the human experiences with us, both good and bad. And it's only through God becoming a human that he's able to fight for us as humans against um, sin and death and defeat those through the cross and his resurrection. And, I, you know, um, it's also important for us today because Gnosticism rears its ugly head in different ways. We don't um, value our bodies as, as we ought to. And uh, we don't value, for example, the distinctions of the sexes. And um, we don't value men as men or women as women. We don't value how men and women are made for each other and how they're meant to um, work together for the good of, of humanity. And uh, society is very confused about these things. And so it's very, very important for us to... Um, to confess that God became a human because in, in God becoming a man through the Virgin Mary, we are affirming both the goodness of the male and the female body. And God gives us um, an understanding of how, uh, of the goodness of this and how um, this differentiation within our bodies is meant for us to love each other and for us to, um, to show God's love um, into the world. And there's a lot more I could say about this. Um, I guess I'll just throw in a little advertisement here. We're going to be doing at our 830 Bible study, a study of the theology of the body. And we're using Timothy Tennant's new book for the body. And I, I invite you to our 830 a.m. Bible study, be, not beginning this Sunday, but next Sunday. And we're going to start going through that book. So we'll, we'll have a lot more to say about how the body is important for theology. Okay, let's continue. <clears throat> 56. Was Mary the only biological parent of Jesus? Yes. While still a virgin, Mary submitted to the will of God and bore the Son of God. Therefore, she is held in high honor. However, in obedience to God, Joseph took Mary as his wife and raised Jesus as his son. So the, the, the catechism is going out of its way to make this point, and I think it's because this is a place where when people begin to lose um, faith, and, and begin to distrust God and his word, this is one of the first places they do it. So uh, the, the catechism is trying to be really emphatic here. And so what we're saying is that Jesus was born into a family. Joseph was his father and Mary his mother. As ordained by God in Genesis 2, this was a, this was a family. However, however, Joseph was not his biological father. Mary did not have sexual relations with Joseph 
until at least Jesus was born. Um, now, there's another question here. Historically, there's been a debate whether or not Mary was a perpetually a virgin um, or not. And that's an open question, although most theologians through church history have affirmed that, Jesus, that uh, Mary was a perpetual virgin. Um, as, as strange as that might sound to us, our sex-obsessed um, culture, um, it, it, it wouldn't have been a strange thought to, to early Christians. In fact, there's multiple accounts of Christian couples deciding to not consummate their marriage, but instead to live in a lifelong friendship as co-workers for the gospel. And... Uh, to remain virgins even even within their marriage and I know that sounds crazy to us but that's a that was a real thing um, so um, as Anglicans we give Mary honor the honor um, of being the the mother of Jesus sometimes in other churches especially a Protestant church well yeah Protestant churches um, to talk positively about Mary is seen and reacted against as being too Catholic or idolatrous somehow or belittling Jesus somehow it's like Mary and Jesus are are placed as being against each other somehow but um, as Anglicans we don't think this way about Mary we are very very glad to bless her with the words of Sarah remember what Sarah says to her upon upon meeting her and and, uh, and knowing the good news uh, she says blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb and so uh, we bless Mary, because she has a place of honor in being the mother of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, I believe that recovering a theology of Mary is imperative in our day, in our sex-confused culture. So she's a very, very important part of, uh, of Christianity. Okay, uh, question 57. What is the relationship between Jesus' divine and human natures? That's a good question. At the moment of Jesus' conception, the divine nature of the one eternal person of the Son was united to our human nature. Therefore, Jesus Christ is fully and truly both divine and human, but without sin. His two natures are united without division, separation, mixture, or change. Um, what the Catechism is doing at the very end there is basically quoting the definition of Chalcedon or Chalcedon, depending on how you like to say that, um, which is the statement of orthodoxy related to how um, we believe the two natures of Jesus um, exist in one person. Okay, so what we're what are we saying here? This is a doctrine that's difficult to understand, like the doctrine of the Trinity, and it's called the hypostatic union, and that's a fancy theological way of saying that Jesus is both God and man in one person and like with the trinity it's really easy to slip into some sort of untruth um, when talking about this so what, we, what we're confessing is jesus is 100 percent god and 100 percent human together in one and only one person so there's a lot of ways to think about this that aren't right he's not 50 percent god 50 percent human He's not 50% God, 50% human, mixed together into some third thing. Um, he's not like a sock puppet, where the sock is a body and inside is is a divine, is the divine um, soul or something like that. He's not like two boards glued together, like one board is God and one board is, is humanity. Um, no, all these are wrong. Jesus was, is 100% human and 100% God two natures fully in one person not two persons one person and uh, like the trinity um, we can define this um, only so far mostly we define it by saying what it's not <laughs> because it's a mystery and we and we don't know exactly um, everything about this truth but we hold on to the tension here because that's what's revealed to us in scripture and and through the christian tradition okay continuing our last and final question for today. What does the union of Jesus' two natures teach you about his ministry? All Jesus does as a human being, he also does as God. His human words and deeds are saving because they are the words and deeds of God the Son. That's really good. Okay, so what the incarnation does is that it allows God to act in the world 
as a fully authentic human. So the deeds of Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, this human living in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, are the very deeds of God himself. The words of Jesus of Nazareth, who lived in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, are the words of the God of the universe. Full communication and full communion between God and humanity has been established because of the incarnation, because God and humanity are in him one person. So what this means, practically speaking, is that when, when we open up our, our Bibles, we go to one of the four Gospels, and we read the words of Jesus. We're not just reading the, word, uh, the words of some ancient sage, some nice guy. No, we are reading the words of God. And so when we read the, his words, we, we need to humble ourselves and reverence them appropriately, submitting our entire life to his teaching. And not only submitting to them, but expecting them to produce life in us, the same life that brought the entire world into being when God spoke. When God said in Genesis 1, let there be light, and there was light. And so I'll, I'll end it here. Um, go read your Bibles. Go read a gospel tonight. Read it uh, for yourself. Read it to your wife. Read it to your kids, your grandkids. And as you read the words of Jesus, you are reading the words of God, which is an incredible gift to us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.